that we tend with these subjects to only be able to kind of touch the surface on some of these issues. So I hope what you guys will do is use the chat to talk to each other. These webinars, as with everything else we're doing in the community, is to enable you guys to communicate with each other. So use that chat feature. If something pops up, you've tried X, you know, you want to question uh, uh, something that Jess or I had mentioned, and you want to have a chat about it, go over to the chat function and share, share liberally. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and we talked about this last time, is part of what we're doing with these webinars and everything else is building up a, a place for you to share your brain, not not just ours and the, and the guests, but even you can be guests. Uh, you can be contributors to the blog. You can be webinar contributors. I can do interviews with you. We're trying to enable you to contribute. If you want to contribute, all you have to do is email community at lawinsider.com. We'll talk to you about that process, what's involved, what kind of subjects we're looking for, right? Uh, what we want to hear from you guys, um, answers that we need to different questions that are popping up. So please use community at lawinsider.com. So that out of the way, uh, introductions real quick. I'm Mike Whalen. I wrote a book called Lawyer Forward, Finding Your Place in the Future of Law. I also have a podcast called Lawyer Forward where I tell stories and apply them to the legal industry. So I hope you will go and listen to that. I am here with my friend, Jess Birkin, who is in a place called Minneapolis. Minnesconsin, what do you Minnesconsin. call it? It's all the same. Uh, Jess uh, is gonna talk to us about switching to subscriptions in her practice. This comes up a lot with people in business practice, uh, mm -hmm. especially. And so Jess, you have an interesting practice, a bit of a weird context. Uh, I hope you'll share that with us. What I'm gonna do is give you about 30, until about the you know half hour, to tell us, you know, you've prepared a presentation, share that with us, and at the end, we'll get into some Q&A period. Cool? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Thanks for having me. I uh, will give you the time. All right. Uh, <laughs> you have to make me host. It's oh, I do. Screen sharing, not allowed. Uh, let's see, make co-host. Not working? It is working. All right. See, guys, it's a technology show, just FYI. That's right. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started. Um, if you are on Twitter, come find me. I am on Twitter at Jess Birkin. If you like what I'm saying, tweet at me. If you don't like what I'm saying, also tweet at me because it's fun to fight on the internet. So come on over to Law Twitter. It's a great place to be if you aren't there already. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. Now, this is me. This is a shot from my website. I'm, I'm a, a lawyer that works with nonprofits. I used to work in-house at a big nonprofit, and I left for private practice. I was working with, you know, small nonprofit clients. Hung my own shingle. I'm doing my thing. I have great clients. I'm good at my work, but four or five years into my private practice, I really started feeling like this little Lego guy right here making the, like, spreading face. Something was just really dissatisfying in my practice. Um, my computer is freezing, which is awesome. Here we go. Go analog, keyboard mode. So why was I feeling like that Lego guy, right? Um, the problem for me in my law practice was not running the business. I actually really like that part. I'm, I'm pretty good at it. I love tech. I like creating efficiencies. Like my middle name should be Zapier. I'm not afraid to try new things or find a better way. And I love the nonprofit sector. I have a master's in nonprofit management. I feel great about the kind of work I do. I could sleep at night, but I was just starting to feel overwhelmed and really annoyed by my clients and their problems. They were basically driving me bonkers. I was just in fire mode all the time. So I was just putting out their fires and people would contact me with their emergency situations that they should have asked for help long time ago. They should have asked me before they signed the, the contract paperwork or whatever. Um, you know, but I would get the phone call at an employee just filed a complaint against us or, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to get this real estate deal done uh, tomorrow and I need you to like deal with it because it's all going sideways. Or could you just look this over because I'm, I'm about to sign this agreement. 
basically I was just triage, drinking out of the fire hose, putting out people's garbage fires. And for me personally, this was not why I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I don't like firefighting. I, I do what I do because I like preventing problems and I want all of my clients to be strong nonprofits. And it really bugs me personally when they wait too long um, to get advice, right? And when I, back in the day when I was a student and I was at a criminal defense firm, it would be the same thing, right? You know, you get the client that gets some paperwork in the mail and then they're like, oh, I, well, I had this warrant, but it didn't respond. And now it's escalated into this situation. Clients do this all the time. Um, so my clients were waiting too long to get advice and they weren't, they were already like all in on a thing before they would call me. So they would show up with these short deadlines that made me super stressed out because I want to make my clients happy. I want to help them get their real estate deal done. I want to help them get out of their problem. Um, but they just wanted like all this last minute stuff and I couldn't figure out why that was happening. Uh, and at the same time, I had this other suspicion that my, my clients weren't really that happy with me either. Right, I was starting to feel like customer satisfaction was a problem for them. Now, we already said I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and if you've seen you know, Fargo or any of the stuff about the Midwest, then you're aware that these people are very indirect communicators, okay? Um, now, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so I'm on the correct side of the Mississippi River in the States for being more direct. I'm a very direct communicator, but my clients here in Minnesota, they're very, they'll talk all around something and they won't actually tell you what they think. So we all know people like that or have, you know, cultural interactions like that. So I was picking up the telltale signs that my clients were not happy. When, you know, clients wanted to like limit the scope of what I was gonna do. Like, well, I think I can make this contract and then I'll just have you look it over, right? Or they're gonna do some of the work themselves by helping me. And we've all been there, right? Um, or like I would have clients who would just disappear for like months only to show up with some big problem that they didn't tell me about until it was too late. And I realized it was because they didn't want to call and ask, you know, one question and get a bill for the 10 minutes. But, on the other hand, I had this one client that was like super, super happy. Um, they were my first private practice client. I took them on a pro bono basis because they asked me to be on their board and I was like, uh, no, but I'll just be your lawyer for free. Um, and they were always happy. They were a super happy client. They never had a dumpster fire. They included me on like every major decision they ever made. And anything that had like a legal angle, they were, they were quick to include me early and often. They got good advice. And in the five years that I represented them, they had virtually no major blowups and, and no near misses, right? I, I even brought them through like a merger with another organization where it was kind of like emotionally dicey and everything was fine. So I was like, what's different about that client? Um, and then I invited this other client of mine for coffee. I, you know, I was like, I just hadn't seen this executive director in a long time. And I said, hey, I'm gonna call up so-and-so and invite her to coffee just to like connect. Cause I just, you know, it's like a good relationship building thing. And when I did that, I had this light bulb moment where I emailed her and said, hey, I just wanted to invite you to coffee. I haven't seen you in a long time. And she wrote back to me and asked me if there would be a charge for meeting her for coffee. And I basically made this face that this little kid is making right here. It was like total face palm, like, oh my God, she thinks that I'm going to have the clock running and that this is like a way for me to bill her. And for me, that's the moment that it really hit home that the problem was just the basic billing structure of my firm. My clients really didn't enjoy feeling nickel and dimed for every minute of time I was talking to them. And that was pushing them to not reach out sooner. That was pushing them to get themselves into self-help situations that made their problems worse. So the time thing 
became a focus for me. And I was like, sure, like nobody likes to get a bill for five minutes. And they also don't like to hear, you shouldn't have done this. This was a mistake. You should have contacted me earlier. Um, and they also, because they don't want to get that billable time pain, they ended up patching together a bunch of like free advice. So some clients were looking on the internet. Um, like we've all been there when we think we have a medical ailment and you start just like Googling on WebMD <laughs> to figure out what's wrong with you. Our clients do that too, right? So then when it's a bigger deal or it just gets to a point where they're like, I, the internet isn't gonna help me with this, then they were calling. So I just started thinking, you know, how can I get clients to talk to me earlier and more often so I personally enjoyed my work more and got more satisfaction out of it for them? How could I help them ab avoid big expensive problems? Um, how could I help control their costs, but I still make money, right? Because I work with nonprofits, but I am not a nonprofit. I need to eat. <laughs> so that was kind of my, like, those were my goals. How can I do this for my clients? And I am the weird kind of person who, yes, I'm a lawyer, but also I'm really into like business and entrepreneurship. I'm a huge fan of Gary V and Ramit Sethi and I follow Seth Godin and I go to these weird conferences about like the future of law practice and CleoCon and listen to legal podcasts about marketing. So I have all these like ideas swirling in my head. And I said, you know, well, what about subscription services? This, this has to be like an answer that I can do. Everything in the world is going to subscriptions. So I start looking at the marketplace in legal and I'm like, who else is doing legal subscriptions, right? There must be some. And at that point, I'm looking for idea validation. Like, is this a thing? Because if it's a thing, then I feel better about also doing it, right? I don't want to necessarily be the very first pioneer in the space. So it turns out, yeah, it's a thing, right? Um, John Tobin had, has this creator's legal program. Kim Bennett, she's got a subscription program for her business clients. Erin Levine ends up spinning up Hello Divorce shortly after we were at a conference together. Um, LegalZoom, the, the big bad corporation, is offering subscription plans for individuals. Um, there are some homeowners associations that uh, legal subscription offerings. And then, you know, I happened to meet uh, Alan Rodriguez at 1400 and they're building subscription tools. So I'm like, all right, this is market validation to me. Like, it's safe to move forward. And I had to start thinking about what do my clients really want from a subscription plan? Now, this is gonna be different for everybody, but this is what I came up with. So I just like sat down at the drawing board and was like, what do my clients really need and want? Now, everybody likes to think that their practice is like magical and different and their clients are like special and unique and this will never work for them. But I do think that most clients really have some things in common and they want, to know how much something costs, right? What's the first thing that you do when you buy something or you're talking to an expensive consultant about getting some help with your law firm, you are like, how much is this gonna cost me? So everybody wants to know what it's gonna cost. They wanna feel like they're getting something of value. Um, they want to be able to quit if they don't want to keep going. They want to access legal services when it's convenient for them. That's why the internet is amazing because it's always available 24 seven, right? Um, and they want to feel safe and secure because they hire me so that they feel like so something is being taken care of. And then I had to think about what do I want? So that matters because this is my life and I don't want to be miserable and one of the statistics of like anxious alcoholic suicidal attorneys. So for me, I was like, okay, now what, what meets my needs? Well, I want to not go broke. Uh, that would be good. I want to provide value that does not involve time tickets. So I started thinking what's scalable, how can I productize what's in my head and put it somewhere. 
Um, I want to get paid for the things that I usually don't charge for, but are actually really valuable. A lot of times my clients would ask me a quick question and I would just tell them the answer or, you know, they're like, oh, I, I need this kind of a document. And I'm like, here, I have a template, just take it. And I can't really bill them for that because it's time billing. What am I going to bill them for the 30 second email when I atta attach my little sample participant waiver? You know, no, I just give them that to like be a good lawyer. Um, and I wanted to create something new and not just repackage the like same old, same old and call it a subscription. And I also wanted to have more fun and enjoy my work. So what I ended up coming up with is my program, which is called Mission Guardian. You can like feel free to go poke around the website, take a look at it, all the pricing and how it works and all that is like all on the website. I'm not gonna get into all of that or like the tech stack or how I made it. That's a different, a different talk. Um, but feel free to poke around on it. If you have questions, there's a contact form. You can just shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer those questions for you or post them in the Q&A and Mike will ask them of me later. Um, so I was, I was looking at, you know, the other folks in the space and I was reading about subscription services and I happened to notice that um, in Alan Rodriguez's article at 1400, he used to be at LegalZoom in their subscriptions division. And he basically said that once they started offering subscription legal services, that plan accounted for about 24% of LegalZoom's revenue only one year after launching the service. And if you don't know what LegalZoom is, this is a document preparation company. The, we are not a law firm, but you can get like a very inexpensive will prepared because they have an online questionnaire that asks the client you know, da, 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 who are your children and this, that, and the other, and outspits a will. Well, they also have a subscription plan. And they went from massive document prep company to a quarter of their business is in subscription services. So there is definitely a demand for this in the market from consumers. So now for you, how do you start thinking about your potential for subscription plans, right? So you have to consider, what do your clients want? Well, I, you know, I already said, I think they want to know how much something costs. They want to feel like they're getting something of value. But what else is unique to your practice, right? People are always like, oh, Jess, tell me all about your subscription because I'm thinking about doing this for myself. I'm like, I can tell you about my subscription all day long, but that doesn't mean it works for you, right? Your practice is different. So I would advocate you should ask your clients, ask them, what do they like about working with you? What is the value that they get out of working with you? Um, and you can outsource that. You can have somebody do the calls and ask the questions. You don't have to do that yourself. Um, but find out what can you give them that's not your billable time because they don't value your time. They value their own time, um, but they don't, they're not buying your time. They're buying something else. So is it, what is it that they need from you? Do they need to be educated about their issue? Are you providing coaching? Because like you're a divorce lawyer and a lot of the process is just like coaching people through this huge life change that they're going through. Um, what is it that you do that has absolutely nothing to do with the law, but actually adds value to your clients? That's something that I would spend some time thinking about. And then what makes your job more fun, right? Who are your ideal clients? And you know that you have them. And who are your like worst clients? Like who are the people where you're like, I never want to work with them or anyone like them ever again. Why are your good clients good? And why are your horrible clients horrible? And how do you make something that attracts your favorite clients and the persona of your favorite clients? Because you, the worst case scenario is that you make something that attracts the people that you hate to work with because you'll just get more of that, right? And we want you to be happy and fulfilled and not be a lawyer statistic. And the big one is how do you avoid going broke? And this sounds funny, but like seriously though, 
Uh, the thing that is the most scary uh, for me in particular, and I think for others, is losing money on flat fees. Like everybody has a horror story about, oh, I tried flat fees once and it was a cluster. Um, or I tried a flat fee thing once and I got burned. Um, or maybe you're you're scared of being stuck with clients and not being able to like exit the relationship. So build it in a way that that's not a thing. Um, there's a divorce lawyer that was featured on the Lawyerist podcast. I forget his name right now, but he basically is kind of a subscription. It's more like a payment plan, but basically he goes in four month chunks and you pay for four months in four month increments. And then every four months it renews. And so that's an opportunity for him to say, you know what, this, this doesn't work for me anymore. We're gonna part ways. And he's built it so that it's timed out because he knows right around that mark, you've finished mediation and it's like, either we're going to trial or we're not. So it's a really convenient point to like offboard people and to create incentives for those who need to settle to like get it done in your four month window. Um, think about the scope, right? Define it and stick to it. When you're creating something that's a subscription or a flat fee, you are gonna get burned. Like I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. That's, that's the way it goes. That's how you build flat fee products. You decide what the scope of work is, then you sell it, then you do it, then you get burned, and then you go, aha, uh, I need to work on that scope for next time. Um, that's okay. It's okay to make mistakes and learn those lessons. Sometimes as lawyers, when we're building something like this, we're striving for perfection because we're like overachievers and we want it to be perfect and impenetrable and like we'll, we'll make money. It's like you're going to lose money on a couple of these because you're gonna learn a couple of tough lessons and that's okay. You're testing, it's beta testing. Um, you don't, and you don't need to make a big announcement about your subscription program, right? Like I didn't really like come out of the closet about my subscription program for a really long time. I think it was like maybe four or five months because I just wanted to like get into it and try it and be figuring out like, does this actually work before I, you know, blast it all over my website and like sing the hallelujah chorus from the <laughs> rafters or whatever. Um, try it with new clients and see how it works. You can always, you can always quit. Like, it's okay. Um, I offered a choice for the whole first year that I offered subscriptions. I had like a choose your own adventure retainer agreement where it was like, this is the new way that I do. And it's like this, and this is how it works. And this is the old way. And this is, you know, hourly billing. And every, every time we talk, the clock is running. And at the end of the retainer agreement, they actually got to tick a box, which one do you want? And I offered both for a while until a year into it, I realized exactly zero new clients had ever chosen hourly billing. And then I just stopped offering the choice. And I was like, okay, I don't, I don't need to worry about this anymore. Um, so you can test things and you can try things. You don't have to like go all in on this or on any thing that you develop in this vein. Um, and I hope that that like gives you some reassurance that you could try it. Okay, so you also do need to get comfortable with trying new things, new systems, new tools and using them. You don't have to make everything yourself. You can hire people to help you, whether that's like a, a website tool from 1400 or a payment tool from Gravity Payments to help you figure out how to collect the money or deliver the content. Um, or maybe somebody like an agile coach, legal project management to help you get your processing time down. But you cannot just go into this and say, I'm going to offer a subscription and do everything at my firm the old way and expect to make money. You have to inherently change how you work because the billable hour model is built on you making money. The more time you take, the more money you make. Whereas flat fees and subscription models, you have to be efficient. There is a margin and the longer it takes, that's where you got scared, right? Because 
the longer it takes, the less your margin is. And you know when that's happening. So this means you need to adapt some things and systematize. Um, or it might mean that you need to like outsource some of the work to like a lawyer on law clerk that you can like offload things to, to keep the costs contained. But you cannot just slap like the word subscription onto your current practice and expect that it will make you money. You have to, you have to get comfortable with some level of change. Um, so you have to make stuff and you have to break stuff and that's okay. And that can be, it sounds easy, but it's actually can be very intimidating and very scary for people like us who are type A, overachievers, overanalyzers, risk managers. We want to do it right. We have a bunch of rules that apply to us. We're always afraid of breaking the ethics rules. Um, but you can rope in your favorite ethics council, make sure that you're building things that are, you know, legal, <laughs> not going to get you an ethics complaint. And you can like try it and then figure out where it's broken and then fix it and then try it again. And that is okay. And I would just encourage you to think about when you were a 1L in law school or you were just starting out in your schooling, you came in with a beginner's mind and you were like, I have no freaking clue what is going on. They handed you some books and said, figure this out. What's IRAC? What's precedent? You, and you got grilled and you were okay with it. So go back to like pull up that part of you because it's still there. Um, the person that is accepting the challenge and learning something new um, and cultivate that attitude again. And I think that you can have really great success with building something. So we're just about at a half an hour, Mike. So do you want me to throw it back to you so you can run some Q&A? No, you have two minutes to sing a song or, you know, otherwise fill the time. Uh, thank you, you Jess, guys. George Benson. Probably no. smart. <laughs> So we're going to get into some of the questions. I'm seeing good questions in both the chat and the Q&A feature. Remember, if you use the Q&A feature at the bottom, other people can upvote your questions so we know what people are super into. Um, uh, Jess is sharing their ways to connect with her. So I hope you guys will do that. We'll talk about that again at the end. Um, but uh, what we want to do is go through some of these questions, uh, Jess. You mentioned before that this tends to be controversial. I'm seeing a lot of questions sort of in two bundles and we'll break them down. One is, how do I make money? And the other is, how do I not get in trouble? These seem to be the two sort of overriding yeah. questions. So talk to me first about the making money. Um, I had a question from Michael Purvis uh, and another uh, in here about the subscription service and capping the number of hours. How do you go about defining the scope so that it answers to what the client wants, but also you don't get totally screwed. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, you have to, again, go back to what does the client even want? Because a lot of times the mistake that we make as attorneys is that we think we know what's important. And frankly, a lot of times we do know what's important and our clients just don't understand what the issues are. And that's real <clears throat> and that's valid. but it doesn't always translate to what the client wants to buy, if that makes sense. Um, what does the client like actually want to purchase from you? What do they get value out of? It may actually not be pleadings and motions and contracts and the, the, the paper that we generate, right? For my clients, they really value having a strategic person that they can call and ask a question to um, that they can like pre vet something before they bring it to their board. They feel more confident, they feel more secure, and they like knowing that it's covered, right? That works for me and my clients in my practice. But what do your clients buy from you? Like if you're an estate planner, I think you're selling something very different than what I'm selling right? Mm. Because I'm, I'm representing an ongoing business concern that has a special tax status. The estate planner is helping someone, 
you know, they're not buying the paper and the will and the words. They're buying safety and security and peace of mind and like making sure that their children are taken care of. Um, and so th it sounds like weird and like hippy dippy or something, but like when you start thinking about what are those things, you can start um, building your subscription to have stuff in it that isn't necessarily your billable time. Uh, and, and so like the question asked, you know, how do you like cap the time or how do you, well, it's not necessarily about the time. And that's, that's the hurdle that we have to get over mentally, um, if that makes any sense. But if so your like time, a divorce lawyer might like it, put in resources about how to deal with a difficult spouse that you're dealing with, right? It has nothing to do with like legal motions. It has to do with how do you manage a conversation between you and this person. But it is all cost plus thinking, right? Like, so... We, in order to make a profit, you have to be cognizant of cost. So if I've got a firm structure that thinks about hourly utilization rates as the cost that I have to control, right? That's the thing that if that gets out of control, then I can't make any money, which is pr probably just about everybody on this, on this webinar right now. How do you shift from your cost structure? This is probably nerdy, but your cost structure being defined by the hour to something else. I think you mentioned, did you mention law clerk earlier? Somebody asked that. Mm -hmm. uh, did you mention one of these? So like when I'm figuring out my sourcing, my costs, how do I make sure that that's not time-based? So you're, or, you're saying Or could like, it be? Well, it, it could be. You're saying like, how do you determine a price? Right. Yeah. The cost side of it. Yeah. Yeah. So just because I think it gives some clarity around how my model works for my practice. Um, my billing model works like this. My clients pay a flat monthly fee that's relatively inexpensive. Uh, if you go to the website, you can see it's like $100, $300, $800 a month. Like those are my three tiers. Mm. And then anything that's not covered by that base subscription is done on a flat fee project basis. Because I can't possibly promise the world for one low, low monthly price. So, you know, I'm representing a business. They could have an employment issued today and a contract issued tomorrow. Just like, you know, a divorce might seem like it's going to be amicable and then suddenly go sideways, right? So, you know that. <laughs> um, so, I, I do like a, a base plus. So it's a recurring revenue plus flat fees. And so the way that I make money is that recurring revenue is coming in every month, every month, those people are paying. So, you know, we have goals where we're like, we need to get up to X number of subscribers so that we are just covering the operating costs of the firm with recurring monthly revenue. And then the flat fee projects are on top of the re monthly recurring revenue. Mm. So the way my model works is the more that I engage with my clients, the more legal issues I will probably reveal, which will lead to more flat fee projects. Now, not, not everybody's practice works that way. So if you are going from, I want a divorce to I am done with my divorce, there's like a life cycle there that you're going to work them through and then they're going to drop off. So you have like a, a different factor that's like, I have to bring in this many people every month just to like keep a certain level of recurring revenue. So these are all like the things that you get into when you plan your, your model, but it's like, what are you offering? I'm offering unlimited scheduled calls with me. Um, so there is no time component because theoretically a person could use 10 hours per month. Uh, like you get to schedule 15 minute calls with me for any new issue. I have it very clearly stated that it's for new issues only. Um, and that, that terrified me. I was scared to death that I was going to go broke doing 15 minute calls, unlimited, you know, scheduled calls all day long. And it turns out it's like the gym. Some people, they like to have a weekly call or a monthly call and they use it religiously. And a lot of people, I don't hear from them for like months at a time.
So there are things you can do that sound financially like a doomsday scenario, but until you try it, you actually don't know. Hmm. I'm resisting the urge to tell you a story about Best Buy and how it responded to Amazon, but I'm not going to nerd too much unless you guys want me to tell that story. But <laughs> it's interesting because you're sort of pivoting what part of the bundle, right? Like legal services are a bundle of many goods and you're just sort of shifting what bun piece of the bundle we're talking about. Uh, I do want to get to, Michael's got a good list of questions. So let me get through some of these. Um, he asked, why would a client sign up for the subscription services before they recognize they have a need, right? So if they're not regular legal consumers, so why are we paying for legal services when we don't use them every month? What client thinks ahead this much? Uh, so are you, is that part of the screen oh, yeah, no. for clients? Nobody, nobody goes to get surgery on their arm unless they have a burning pain, right? Um, absolutely. There are things that motivate my clients to come in with me. Um, just like I'm thinking about leaving my spouse motivates someone to go meet with a divorce attorney. Um, I'm, I just got a cancer diagnosis motivates someone to go create their will and estate plan. Uh, there are things that motivate you to seek legal assistance. And then for me, you know, theoretically, like my clients are going concerned, so they will have more issues over time. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, mo I think I have a couple of clients who are like, I started a nonprofit and I just need to have a great attorney by my side. And I was like, hallelujah, I love you. <laughs> but most people are like, oh, we have this problem. And oh, actually, now that I'm talking to you, we have a lot of problems and probably we should have been asking for help all along. And so we should probably subscribe mm. with you. Well, and I'm assuming to Michael's point, you know, you might in putting up your customer profile, what that person looks like that this service is meant to serve. You may say, these are people who are regular purchasers of legal services who are frustrated with their current hourly, you know what I mean? That, that might be part yeah. of the filter. Well, every practice area has this, right? So first of all, if you're aware of like marketing at all, there's like the client journey that people go through, right? So they first they're aware that they have a problem and then they become aware that it's a legal problem. And then they start to look for potential solutions to their legal problem. And then they realize I could have a lawyer help me with this. And then they, and so they keep going down the line. They go, well, which lawyer should I have help me with this, right? Every client goes through that. I don't care what your practice is. That is the flow of how people make decisions. But also, um, there are certain like 80% of legal matters have no lawyer. Well, that's not necessarily just the A2J gap, right? That's just some people don't want to hire a lawyer. I'm not going to get those people into, they're not going to make it that far. They're going to stop at, I'm aware I have a problem and I think I can do this myself. I'm going to go on nolo.law, whatever, and like find a document and make it because I can do this on my own, right? Any Anytime you've worked in court, you have pro se litigants, they didn't make it that far down the decision tree. Um, so we're all dealing with that all the time. Not everybody is, is going to hire us. Well, and Larry Weiss asked the question, when dealing with these experienced, consu you know, legal consumers, he said, how do you deal with clients who want to compare your subscription fee to an hourly rate? So they're making a decision. They've got you on a sheet with another law firm. Someone actually asked me for rollover minutes if they didn't use up all the subscribe time in a month. And Rebecca asked, uh, mentioned, yeah, it's not just the lawyers that are attuned to the hourly model. It, it, with even with experienced buyers, you're dealing with people who think the hourly is normal. How do you change their culture? Um, I mean, I just had a really great retainer agreement at first. So um, first of all, yes, people are aware that the hourly model is the way lawyers build. That doesn't mean that they like it and wouldn't be very happy to like flip to something where they had certainty. Um, so I think that's a, like, a little bit of a fallacy because I've been doing this for a year and a half now and nobody has ever asked me, how does this shake out compared to another lawyer? 
it's just like they just do that math or because I'm like I don't know what everybody else is charging but you go you can go do that work and I guess mm. they will um but for somebody who's like I can get my divorce done for five thousand dollars every four months or I can have mystery box it's it's I don't think it's about like the hourly rate and the equivalent I think those questions are people being very stuck in mm. but I live and die by the billable hour so I can't fathom a world where that doesn't matter the clients really just care how much it's going to cost that's my take on it but there is a risk I mean Michael Purvis pointed out again it, it seems that clients will sign up when they have a heavy demand for legal services they'll take a few months get a ton of work out of you and then drop the subscription. Oh, yeah. That's I, like, always I, a concern. I've done that with subscription services. I've gone and sure. bought services that I was going to watch a lot. You know, yes, I'm talking about online streaming services because we were going on a trip. Uh, you know, coronavirus. Exactly. Needs Use the heck out of it, then get out of that. Uh, it's a, I'm sort of wondering. That's, and that's a like a legit fear, right. but it's also never happened. Like, but even if it did, like I, I'm assuming that Netflix and CBS and whoever build yeah. in for that. They're like, there's going to sure. be a surge of use at the very beginning. The gym, right? The gym does that. They know there's going to be a surge in use in January and they know yeah. that it's going to peter off as the, the, the thing. And I want you to talk about this word um, that John Tobin told me. He and I had a conversation about this at the Lawyer Forward virtual conference. And what he said was, you've got to stop thinking about individual clients and start thinking about your portfolio of clients. Because that yes. individual client, if you do the math one way or the other, they're going to be great or they're going to be terrible. But in the net, right, in the portfolio, that's the math that really matters. So how do you yes. think of that portfolio more than the individual client? Well, and that goes back to that piece where I was saying, you need to design this for your ideal client. And I'm sorry, but your ideal client is definitely someone who values your service and wants to pay for it. Those are two factors on my scoring sheet that are very important. I have a whole scoring rubric. Like I don't just allow people to subscribe willy nilly um, and not just because conflicts, but because I don't want people polluting my portfolio. So I actually have a scoring rubric. It came from um, a friend of mine went to an ABA family law conference and it came back with this handout that was like this client scorecard. And I was like, this is genius. I'm making this for my practice. Um, and I'm happy to send that to whoever wants it. Just like email me, whatever, go to my website. Um, but you have to decide who are your ideal clients and make something for them. Because like I was saying, you will just attract the worst if you don't take that into account, right? So for me, I have like a few personas of my ideal clients. And one of them is, they have a strong desire to do things right, right? And then I have a few personas of like my worst clients. And one of them is uh, the crazy narcissistic founder who thinks that they're God and wants everybody to worship them and is doing it through a charity. I, I like literally screen for that personality type and I won't let those people come in because mm. it does pollute my portfolio. Absolutely. Uh, Jason Poland, which could either be Jason Poland or his fiance, because they're both using the same login. Uh, he, she wants your, uh, your question, your yeah. uh, rubric. Um, I, I got the question that's come up a few times. Uh, this one's from Cynthia. She says, do you see any ethics issues? Uh, and I know this is going to come up, but uh, in the four month subscription plan and then dropping clients because you're not making enough money. So well, I dealt with this in Texas with what I was doing divorce cases, how you say, I, I'm going to put the money in trust until it's earned theoretically, right? How, how do you define if you're doing month of service, how do you define when it's earned and I can get rid of them because now I did the thing I said I was going to do? Yeah. So first of all, are there ethics issues? Well, yeah, you're taking clients money. Um, so there's always ethics issues, right? The, the lawyer who does the four month term, I, I'm not sure that that's really a subscription program, but it's at least one other way to think about how you would approach like a litigation style practice. And 
I don't know about your state's rules about when you can withdraw and blah, blah, blah. But I would think that you would just put it in your retainer agreement that you agree to pay me a flat fee for four months of representation from this point to this point. And we agree that either of us can discontinue the relationship at that point. Like if you have a rule that says you can't withdraw or I don't know how that, I'm not a family law attorney, but some of this stuff we feel like, oh, because ethics, I can't. But I, I, we don't have great like special lax rules in Minnesota. I just worked with my ethics counsel to make sure that everything that I'm doing is above board within these supposedly very limiting rules, right? Everybody's talking about how like, we have to loosen the rules. And I'm like, I have this totally new style of thing and I do it all within the rules. Now my plan is set up in a way that I'm basically um, collecting a flat fee. The unlimited scheduled calls means they're getting incredible value and they also get access to this huge member portal. So I actually have an entire website that's full of like useful content, forms, policies. And so they're really buying access to my intellectual property, not even necessarily to like my time. Again, like you, we have to get away from the like time component. So. Yeah, I, I, I often tell the story in Travis County in Austin, Texas, we, we wanted to do limited scope representation, right? Like you get in the case, we need to get out. The lawyers wanted to do it, but the judges weren't letting us out of the cases. And so there was this huge move among lawyers to get the judges to create a new local rule that says, we're going to file something that in a very limited way says what our scope is. And when we are done, you judge, you have to let us out. So I, I feel like the rules are constraints in the same way for Walmart physical space is a constraint that does not abdicate the responsibility to figure out our way around it but also you you can change there it's not the bible right like you can change these things uh if you yes. push for it um yeah. i i had a question from um i think it was here we go uh laura asked have you tried both a flat fee per task model and a monthly subscription model uh, which may be two different ways to productize. They may be two different ways to price, depending on how you do it. But she said, how did you decide to go with one rather than the other? What types of services do you include or exclude in the monthly subscription? Sure. So um, just to be clear, like my, the way my particular program works is a base, a base subscription fee that's a recurring fee every month. And then anything that's not covered by that base recurring monthly fee is a flat fee representation. It's a flat fee engagement, right? So I give them a scope of work. They pay me a flat fee to do the project. And then we do the project. Meanwhile, the recurring payment is happening every month, right? So I might have a nonprofit that comes in and they say, great, we want to sign up and be subscribers. So they put it in their credit card. That starts ticking every month. And the reason they came in is because they lost their IRS tax exemption and they want me to go reapply. So now that's reapplying for tax exemption is not covered by my base layer subscription. So that's a project. They go to my member portal. They pay for that with their credit card separately. There's a defined scope of work for what that project is. And, I, and then we start on that project, work that through the system. When the project is done, they're still my client, they still get the base subscription um, and we just keep going like that and they pop up with a project and then they drop back down and they pop up with a project, but all along they are still a subscriber. They're still paying me a monthly fee. They still have access to all my content documents, all of that stuff. Um, I want to make sure I go circle back to that question about what about people just using you like crazy and then dropping yeah. off. And one of the things that I learned from Alan Rodriguez is that um, if people pay for something for nine months, they will just pay for it forever. That's like some sort of marketing business math proven study that like once you're used to just, you've got Netflix and it comes out of your account for $11.99 a month after, you know, nine months, you just don't think about it anymore. And so 
one of the things that I thought about when creating my plan was like, how do I keep people really engaged in the first year? Because if I can keep them really engaged and really serve value to them and be generous and have that first year be a really positive experience, if you have a practice that lends itself to this being, you know, in perpetuity or for two years or three years or something, um, that's the, like the goal that I was like trying to meet so that they don't just use me for a couple of months and then drop off. And sometimes in an intake meeting, someone will say something like, oh yeah, I could see we would do that for like a month. And then I, I put it on my scorecard. No, <laughs> because that's not the kind of client I want in my portfolio. Yeah, on, on your previous point, Jason, the real Jason Poland has stood up um, and he uh, said, do you automatically charge clients a cre on a credit card as opposed to invoicing them? Do you feel like it's necessary to get, here's an invoice, you affirmatively give me something and therefore you've retained me for another month? Or does the automatic card, do you think, do enough? And maybe this is a question for ethics counsel, like you said, but does that do enough for them to say, I agree? Well, in my, in my engagement letter, my retainer agreement, it's, it says you're going to pay a monthly fee and there's no long-term commitment. I should make that clear. Like I don't try and trap people into a year long commitment or anything for me. I don't want to do that. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't want to like get them through a four month period or you know, whatever is right for your practice. But with respect to like, should I send them an invoice? Hell no take their credit card. And I don't care about the merchant fees. 97% of something is better than 100% of nothing, first of all. Second of all, you are going to pay either yourself or a staff person to chase those invoices every month and you're going to spend money on collections and that's inefficient and that costs you money. Third of all, every time you send them an invoice, they have to think about paying you. They have to think, do I use this? Mm -hmm. Do I like this? Do I want to keep paying for this? Hell no. Take their credit card, put it on recurring, work with your counsel to make sure you do it in a way that's ethical and meets the standards. But like, no, don't invoice every month for a subscription. That's like defeating the purpose. Uh, so uh, it, it, this, you mentioned this before, I wanted to ask you about it. Gary asked, can you explain how you tiered your subscription model? It sounds like it, the subscription tiers are based on amount of access to you. Is that right? Um, yes and no. So I have four, and again, like people are always like, tell me about your subscription so I can do this. And I'm like, I will tell you about my subscription all day long. That doesn't mean it's the right exact model for you, right? You have to make the thing that works for you and your ideal clients. But that said, my tiers, uh, like, so I have a, I do a lot of startups. I love helping new organizations get started. I start them out strong, get their tax exemption, like, I like it because I can do it for anybody because it's federal. It's great. Um, what the new subscriber level is, it's the cheapest level and they have the least amount of content in the portal. So my website, I am able to limit the, what they see. So all they see is what they need in the first two years of being a nonprofit. They just have, it's like basics. You're just getting started. You don't have employees. You don't have a lease. You don't have a space. You don't have gift acceptance policies and complicated things going on. You need the basic 101, I just started a nonprofit, what the hell am I doing here stuff. And so they get a choked down version of all of my forms and policies. They just get what they need in those first two years. The second they hire an employee, rent a space, buy a building, do those kinds of things, they should be graduating into the next phase, which is $300 a month. And it, that expands their access in the website to more content that meets more of their needs because they're growing and it's more complicated for them. And then the higher level, they basically get some expensive flat fee projects built into their model. Uh, real quick before we close up, I'm going to tell the Best Buy story because Sarah and Jason told me I had to. One of the Jasons. Uh, very briefly, Best Buy used to sell things. You go in there, you buy things, and you leave. That was the purpose. It was a point of sale. But then Amazon came along, and people were going in and taking their phone and using it to, like, touch things. 
and then they'd go over and they'd just buy it on Amazon or whatever. No roaming. And so initially they were like, they were trying to block people's cell phone signals. When you went in on Black Friday, they would like take your phone. And I feel like this is sort of where we are with legal zoom and all that. There are, there are these outside threats. And so what Best Buy did after a while is they realized, wait, touching things is valuable. And so who's getting that value? It's Samsung and Apple. And so they completely redesigned their building. So now there's like an Apple, it looks like a trade show. You, there's like an Apple section. It's not laptops over here and phones over here. It's Apple pays for prime space. Samsung pays for prime space. So they're, they focused on a different value and build someone differently. And so I think what you've done is you've taken that bundle of goods that people get when hiring an attorney, and instead of focusing on hourly, which is a deliverable, I guess, though I'm not sure what it delivers, but instead of focusing on documents, right? You said, what's another value that I can bill for? And it's this decision-making thing. It's like people just want an adult in the room sometimes. And your subscription model focuses on that. There is a way to do a subscription model that is built on creating forms, which is a different value. It's a pricing yeah. method associated with something. I would really recommend you guys, if you're looking deep into pricing, go look at Ron Baker's book, uh, Implementing Value Pricing. It's nerdy and beautiful and really good. Uh, Jess, uh, there are a bunch more questions. I hope what you guys will do is continue the conversation. If you've got experience with this, send an email to community at lawinsider.com. We want to hear your experience. We'll talk to you about it. Jess, again, just remind people if they want to get in touch with you, how to do that. Yes. Um, and if you had a question and didn't get answered, please feel free to contact me. I will totally answer whatever questions that I can. Just drop me an email. My information is also, I just put it in the chat, jess at birkinlaw.com or find me on my website, birkinlaw.com. You can find the contact form. You can do this. Reach out, get in touch. Find me on Twitter at Jess Birkin. And I just want to point out, Today is my birthday, and earlier someone asked me, what are you doing on your birthday? I said, I'm writing, I'm recording a webinar, and then I'm looking at my container garden on the back porch because it's COVID, people, and this is what COVID birthdays look like. Hashtag Thank you, everybody. Exactly. Happy birthday, Mike. Hey, thanks. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will see you. Remember, we do these the first and third Thursday of each month. If you want to be a contributor, go to community at lawinsider.com. Let us know. We want to talk to you, and we'll see you guys out in the world. Thank you. Bye.